This section of the exhibition is called Life of the Home Front and describes life of the period during the First World War. So here we have Tisha's desk and the children's desks and the blackboard. But we've got one or two interesting things here as well. Over here we have in the showcase we have two rather wonderful figures of the period. They're spelled to wear and the lady on the left is the spirit of telegraphy. She has her hand on a large Morse key and the gentleman on the right is the spirit of telephony and he's got all these insulators and so on. They're standing on a pile of, of cables so that is very interesting. Going back to the school room for a minute you'll notice a couple of holes. I had some children in the other day and said what's they for? Nobody had a clue so I said they were ink wells. The whole concept of liquid ink surprised them and they had no idea that this was a pen and the thoughts of a blotter nearly sent them up the wall. What do you want a blotter for? So at school this is how things have differed. Now if you look over here we have a rather beautiful long case clock. Um, there's a picture on the wall of a very similar clock but it's different. It has this very fancy ornate pediment on top. This clock is missing it. The story is the clock's about 1908 and it's German. The beautiful pediment has a German eagle on top. We think that the last thing you wanted during the war would be to have a German eagle dominating your living room. So they got taken off and probably used as firewood. To me, it's military developments in electronics and communication since World War I. During World War I there was wireless but it was fairly primitive. By World War II it had developed a lot and we have an example here of a German EK receiver that came out of a Heinkel bomber that was shot down in the first air raid on the fourth bridge in October 1939. It's a marvellous piece of engineering. It is in fact miniaturised to an amazing extent for the 1940s. The downside was that it was almost impossible to service it in the field, unlike the British equivalent. But a very well engineered piece of kit, nevertheless. Also in this bay, over at the other side here, we have a very rare piece of equipment. It is in fact the radar set from a British fighter that was developed in the 19, early 1960s and was cancelled, the TSR-2. The airborne radar set here was built by Ferrantes in Edinburgh and at the time it was state of the art. Ferrantes went on to be one of the world leaders in radar technology. Welcome to our hospital. This is a, probably something rather like a field hospital would have been, but it's probably too clean and tidy. Um, we, we get children around here all the time, and they are fascinated, horrified by the loss of limbs, but quite interested with the chamber pot underneath the bed, though I don't suppose there really was one in reality. We just happened to have a chamber pot. Um, the war, well, the me medical advancements were very, very great during the war. There was a start of plastic surgery, of prosthetic limbs. X-rays became fairly commonplace, as did blood transfusions. So really it was one of the very, very few advantages of war. It's so sad that you have to have a war to make things happen. Um, shell shock was another terrible thing and at the time people didn't realise that it was an illness. They just thought it was cowardice and in some extreme conditions people could be shot and were. 
um, around the corner you can see some very old electric shock equipment which is a bit scary. Well x-rays were um, discovered in 1895 by Ronchen in Germany. They were called x-rays because people didn't really know what they were but they knew how to make them which was to accelerate electrons at very high speed and strike a metal target in a vacuum. Something came out then which would expose a photographic plate and they didn't know what it was so they called it an x-ray. They found that if they put a photographic plate or photographic film underneath the patient and applied a very high voltage from an induction coil to an x-ray tube for a period of perhaps half a minute or a minute then when they developed the photographic plate they saw a shadow image of the patient's body with the bones showing up as lighter grey and metal objects showing up as pure white. This meant that they could detect shrapnel or bullets in the body and also broken limbs. Well, when we set up this exhibition, we thought, we need a trench. Now, before you set an exhibition up, you, you do a lot of cleaning and polishing and painting, usually. But with us, we didn't do that. We were scratching our heads in dismay, saying, how do we get some muddy water? How do we make it dirty? So really, as trenches go, this is far too clinically clean, but uh, it's the best we could do. Uh, if you look at the picture on the wall here, you can see this poor man is standing up to almost up to his knees in muddy water. In those days, there were no such things as wellies, so you just had to get wet. Must have been dreadful. I think the, the pure horror of living in a trench must have been frightful. It must have been incredible smells. The food was bad, the sanitation was disgusting. And in addition to everything else, you had little friends like this, little fat rats. And also, you had lice. If you came off the front line, your first stop was, wait for it, the delousing station. So that must have been dreadful. Not only were the lice inconvenient and uncomfortable, but they also carried typhoid. And again, that was one good thing that came out of the war, was that virtually every soldier was um, inoculated against typhoid by 1915. Uh, over the top, you used a ladder like this. You didn't poke your head over the top, otherwise you get a severe headache. So you stood on this. That is a firing trench, a, a, a fire step. Stood on there, poked your gun through the sandbags, and took a pot shot at the enemy. If you wanted to see what was going on, again, you didn't put your head over the wall. You used this, you used a periscope. In here, we have a dugout. Really, because we've got some very, very rare equipment in there. So, to protect it, we, we hit on the idea of having a little scene. the First World War, the German high seas fleet were interned in Scapa Flow and on Midsummer Day 1919 they scuttled them where they lay for about 20 years. Now we have here a model of one of the German battleships, the Grosser Kurfurst, and when it was being salvaged in 1937 they found hidden on board a Morse key which we have here. All that equipment should have been taken off the ships when they were interred, but this one had been hidden and it lay there until 1937. 
It was given to a photographer who was visiting the salvage operation by the salvage contractors. And much later, um, it was passed to someone else and eventually it found its way into our collection. It's too long a story to tell, but it's a fascinating story.